I really like the message of that song, You Got a Friend. In fact, we'll probably put it into our regular worship. I mean, most of the time worship is our hearts of God, but worship is also God's Word to us. And uh, we're going to just steal that from James Taylor and make it uh, about God. Amen. Diane, nice to see you back there. Diane had an episode last week. Uh, Heather, good to see you. Amen. Do you know what the... Before I get preaching, do you know what the, the longest chapter in the Bible is and the most difficult chapter in the Bible? Does anybody know? Leviticus. No, chapter, not book. Chapter. You would think. But it's not. I'm going to show you what the longest chapter of the Bible is. Malachi chapter 5. Just turn to the left of Matthew. It's the last book. Malachi chapter 5. This isn't my text, but I want everybody to see. If you got a Bible, I want you to turn to Malachi chapter 5. Malachi 5. There is no text. Malachi 5. Did you find Malachi 5? No. That's because the last chapter and verse in Malachi is chapter 4, and verse 6. But if you go to the very next page, that should be chapter 5. And what do you have there? Nothing. New American White pages. White, yeah. Nothing. That's Malachi chapter 5, the white pages. These white pages separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. So does everybody have white pages there? Yeah. Yeah. Some are blank, some simply say New Testament. Yeah. But these white pages, although they are white, they speak of a period of 400 years. That's why it's the oldest chapter in the Bible. It's 400 years of total darkness. 400 years without any light. 400 years of silence from God. Silence from any prophetic voice at all. That's what those white pages represent. I would not have liked to live in the days of Malachi chapter 5. I mean, think about this. Those white pages represent about five and a half generations of people who didn't hear from God. How would you have liked to live then? Five and a half generations of people who must have thought that God was dead. Now, if you put that in a modern setting, that's like your grandparents and your parents, and you, and your children, and your grandchildren all going through their entire lives without any of them hearing from God. Can you see how blessed we are? I mean, I know some of you are getting the Word of God every day. And then there's some of you who only get it once a week, but at least you're getting it once a week. But this was 400 years of silence. I mean, it's, it's like not hearing a word from God or not hearing a prophet from God since the year 1618. Wow. I'm just trying to put it in perspective. That's before America. That's around the time that the, the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock. And so from the time that the Plymouth landed on, uh, the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock to, to our time today, from that whole time, I mean, that includes the Revolutionary War, the Civil War. No word from God. No evidence of God. Wow. No miracles. No answered prayer. The heavens were brazed and over. No healings. Nothing. It was a spiritual blackout. And if there was ever a period to be called the Dark Ages, this was it. And the last words that God spoke before this 400 year dark age are recorded as for, for us in Malachi 4, verses 5 through 6. I'm going to read them. He said, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great day, great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Wow. And then just like that, the lights 
went out. My God. Okay. How did you do that? It's not working. 400 years and let there be light. And even though God was silent through the whole white page chapter, 400 years, He was still at work in the darkness. Isaiah says in his prophecy of the birth of Jesus in Isaiah 9-2, the people who walk in darkness will what? See a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. And then down in verse 6 of that, that we get that great prophecy. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son will be given. But again, from the time that the light went out, to the time that Jesus Christ comes as the light of the world, was 400 dark, long years. Malachi chapter 5. Amen. Now I'm going to shift gears a little slightly. And I want to ask you a question. Does anybody know who the greatest man outside of Jesus who was ever born? Let's just keep it biblical. John the Baptist. John the greatest. Abraham. You said John Bonnie, Baptist you said that? Great. Well, Bonnie, I hate that. You're going you're gonna to get the award. I'm going to bequeath my award to you. I'm going to tell you what it is. You won't like it. But what was it? Monday night? I've lost track. Friday night. Friday night we went with Mike and Debbie's Deacon group and had a great time over at Roberson. And then we get, she was gonna we were supposed to wear ugliest sweaters. And so I get home, I said, Oh, I forgot sweater. So I just found this old sweater and I wrote on it the ugliest sweater. I saw that. How could I not win? So she had she had three awards for the ugly, uglier and ugliest. And I got the ugliest. Yeah. And the thing is, and I told Debbie, I said, Debbie, I'm the little ward. Shouldn't it say the ugliest sweater? All it said was the ugliest. Oh. So, Bonnie, that's the only ward I have. You're not ugly, but you're going to have to bear it. John the Baptist yeah. was the greatest, greatest man ever born outside of Jesus. That's what that means that, think about it. He was greater than Moses. He was greater than Abraham. He was greater than Isaac. He was greater than Jacob. He was greater than David. He was greater than Peter. He was greater than Paul. He was the greatest man ever born outside of Jesus. How do we know that? Because Jesus says in Matthew, uh, Matthew 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. I want to preach today a pre-Christmas story. Because before there was an immaculate conception, there was another angelic intervention. Luke chapter 1 tells about the birth of this great prophet. When God, without warning, after a 400 years seemingly sabbatical that he was on, all of a sudden, he sends his angel, Gabriel. Gabriel is the same angel that would later announce to Mary that she would have a son and call him Jesus. Yes. But this same angel appeared before this to a man named Zacharias and told him that he and his wife, Elizabeth, who was past the childbearing age, she was older, <laughs> and she would give birth to a son. How would you like... Come on, anybody over 50, how would you like that news? No. I'd kill you. That's like the angel appeared to me in a dream. No, that's an angel appearing to me in a nightmare. But she was there, and I'll give, you, I'll give you a son, and you're to call his name John. And then, listen to this, they said that he would be filled with the Spirit, even in his mother's womb. Uh -huh. I had to wait 30 years. Wow. My wife was filled with the Spirit before I was, and I was a little jealous. Oh, really? I'm, 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 how come true. she gets it? What's the matter with me? Ah! And I'd be, I'd be seeking the back to the Holy Spirit, nothing. She's over. <laughs> nothing. I know the feeling. 
Yeah. So, and you, some of you have heard this story. One time, where I'm at a prayer meeting with just two other guys, me and two other guys, three all together. And I'm down on my knees and I'm praying. And all of a sudden, these two brothers, they don't know what I'm praying for. I wasn't even praying for that, by the way. They just both came up and decided to pray over me and they both laid hands on me. So some of you who haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet, it's coming. But John, why he was in a why he was in the womb. I mean, that's incredible why he was in the womb. And Zechariah gets this message from the angel and he doesn't really believe it. And so Gabriel told him, because you don't believe it, you're not going to be able to speak. You're going to be mute until the baby's born. So all the, all the Gospels talk about this great guy, John the Baptist, but Luke devotes a significant portion of the Gospel to the conception and the birth of these two boys, John and Jesus. And he was very conscious that what he was writing was a fulfillment not only of Old Testament prophecies, but it was a fulfillment of God's eternal plan of salvation. And for more than four centuries, it seemed as if God's plan of redemption had come to a grinding halt. But in His plan that spanned all of Malachi chapter 5, His plan spanned all those four, that 400 year period. God was sending a Savior to the world and Zacharias' son, John, who would be called John the Baptist, would become the messenger, the Savior's forerunner, the one who would announce... His arrival. Amen. And you know who Mary was the mother of Jesus. Elizabeth was the mother of John. And both of these women were to play a big part in it. They were main characters in bringing the good news to the people of Israel and to the world. Their sons would both give their lives to fulfill God's will. So in Luke chapter 2, I'm not even into what I'm preaching on yet or my text yet. But in Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 1... John the Baptist, it records John the Baptist is born six months before the birth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And as soon as his father writes out the name that he was supposed to be called, he said, what's he going to be called, Zacharias? No, no, no. And Elizabeth said, John. They go, John. So they go to, what's he, remember he couldn't talk, so he writes it out. As soon as he wrote out the name John, his vocal cords came to life. Yes. And the people are looking in amazement. And they looked at what happened and all the people were wondering about this child. Yeah. What kind of a kid is this going to turn out to be? Yeah. And Luke chapter 1 and verse 80 says, And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit. And he lived in the deserts or the wilderness until yeah. the day of his public appearance is Israel. <laughs> so here's John. Yeah. He gets born and it's the last we see of him. Yeah. Until he's 30 years old. He spends 30 years in the DSM. And that's not the Doug Stanton Ministries, which is, that's a good place to spend 30 years too. But this is God's desert school of ministry. 30 years he's preparing. Before he emerges into ministry, he spends 30 years in the desert. And those 30 years, now you've got to catch this because this is ridiculous. He spends 30 years preparing for a ministry that's going to last for six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 30 years for six months. 30 years in the desert preparing for a ministry that's going to last for six months. And I thought about that. Maybe we have it backwards. Because we spend three to four years preparing for ministry and then we end up preaching for 20 or 30 years. Maybe we should prepare for 20 or 30 years and only preach for a few years. I mean, think about this. How would you like to prepare for years for some profession, doctor, lawyer, whatever it might be, I mean, you got books, you got studying, you got memorization, you got tests and all these. And when it's finally over, you get your diploma and you're on your way. And what you prepared for is done in six months. Huh. All right. So I want to look at this great man, the greatest man ever born next to Jesus. 
in my text in John chapter 1. If you would turn there. John chapter 1. John. <coughs> it starts out in this text, starting at verse 4, speaking of Jesus. In Jesus, or in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Or the darkness was not able to extinguish the light. That's who Jesus was, the light. Amen. And then verse 6 is speaking about John the Baptist. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that they all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. John now steps into the ministry that he's been preparing for for his entire life. This is his life's calling. He, 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 he's the link between that 400 year dark silent period from that last verse in Malachi to the New Testament. He appears in the very beginning of each one of the Gospels and then he, he just kind of fades into the background. Mm -hmm. And he came to do nothing but to prepare the way for Jesus. To make ready the way of the Lord, he yeah. says. To make his path straight. Yeah. What could be better for a Christian than to make preparations for the coming of Jesus? Amen. This is what John did. He emerges out of the desert. I mean, it's not the kind of guy you would probably want in your church. I mean, he probably had bad breath. Oh, no, no, honey breath. Honey breath. Honey and locust. Locust breath. His hair was worse than mine. Camel hair. I have collie hair. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If your food doesn't have collie hair in it, it ain't food. <laughs> he burst into the scene to announce the kingdom of God that it was about to arrive and people needed to prepare themselves for it. He prepared the way to show the world Jesus. Yes. yes. Amen. And after his birth in Luke chapter 1, now comes the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 2. So he's the forerunner of Jesus. The old covenant is about to come to a close and the new covenant is about to begin. And so now, poof, the light comes back on. Oh, we should have done that, Gary. We should have preached this whole thing in the dark. Ah. And then the light comes back on. See, John understood that his destiny was one thing. One thing. To point people to Jesus. Amen. I came to testify about the light. He came to talk up and build up and edify yes. and magnify Jesus. Yeah. It says that he was not the light, but he came to showcase the light. Amen. Yes. So my title today is The Greatest Showman. Yeah. I'll tell you, I love that musical about P.T. Barnum with that title, The Greatest Showman. How many have seen that? If you haven't seen it, you need to get it. To me, it's one of the greatest musicals I've ever seen. My wife wanted to go see it on her birthday or whatever it was. I was like, oh, man, a musical. All right. So we go see it, and I'm like this. I've watched it. I, I'm not kidding you. I have watched it eight times and still glued to it we were up at scott and abby's house a while ago and scott's got this i can't even tell you i think it's about a 500 inch tv side <laughs> and a sound system that if the earthquake in georgia came from his house <laughs> it just shoot the so he says hey what do you want he says, hey you got the greatest showman stick that on so i watched it for our eighth time and what we're like glued to it you got to see it. It's amazing. The music and everything is amazing. 
But the greatest showman is not P.T. Barnum. The greatest showman is John the Baptist. Yes. He sets up the Christmas story. He's called the forerunner of Jesus. He was a very humble man. You know why? He refused to accept names and titles that men tried to put on. In Luke chapter 3 and verse 16, in answers to, hey, are you the Christ? Wow, that's pretty flattering. Are you the Christ? He said, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not to fit to untie the thong of his sandals, and he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Yes, amen. His whole ministry was all about Jesus. Yes. Some time ago, I was involved in a tent revival, and some of you were part of that, that lasted for and <clears throat> like 13 weeks, I think it was, throughout the summer. Different churches, different praise bands, different preachers every week. And the title of it was, It's All About Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. John's whole ministry was all about Jesus. I mean, how many of us can really say that? Right. He was constantly showcasing, not himself, but the light of the world. Yeah. Do you know that's what every Christian is called to do? Yes. To showcase Jesus. the light. Yes. Amen. His life and character is the true example of the life and character that all Christians should live out on a daily basis before others. Our lives should showcase Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know there's nothing worse Amen. than you mention somebody's name and say, yeah, they come to our church. <coughs> And they say, huh? they do. <laughs> Their lives don't showcase Jesus. All right. He wasn't looking to make himself famous. No. He was looking to make Jesus famous. Yes. And when Jesus comes on the scene, now you've got to get a picture of this because John was very popular. Jesus comes on the scene and John is popular preacher as he was. I mean, tens of thousands of people were coming to hear this man preach and to repent of their sins and be baptized. He was yeah. very popular. Amen. But as soon as Jesus steps onto the scene, he steps quietly into the shadows yes. and puts the spotlight on Jesus. Yes. Yes. Matter of fact, John said of that, he said, He must increase and I, and I must decrease. Yes. That's the kind of a man this man was. Amen. So while he's baptized and Jesus comes one day to be baptized from him to fulfill scripture. Amen. And as Jesus approached as, as Jesus approached John to get baptized, John just looks up and he points. And everybody stops and everybody turns in the direction that he's pointing. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yes. That's His introduction of the world to Jesus. And as soon as He introduces Jesus, that's when Jesus' his three and a half year ministry began. That was His ordination. Now, when Jesus was in the shadows, He had not yet been presented publicly for public ministry. John, exalts Jesus. Yes. He magnifies Jesus. And even though John felt that he wasn't the one who should be baptized in Jesus, Jesus right. should be baptized in him. But at Jesus' yes. insistence, he baptizes Jesus. Yes. And when he did, we sang about open up the heaven. The heavens opened up and a dove descended upon Jesus and a voice was heard from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Yes. So by baptizing Jesus, John introduces him to the world. Amen. See church, if you're a Christian today, that is our commission. That is our calling to show Jesus to the world. Yes. It's not enough to say, oh, I'm a Christian. We show Jesus to the world. Because there's people out there that are hurting. There are people out there who have cancer and going through health problems. There are people out there who are going through yes. divorces and all kinds of hurting things. What do we do? Behold the Lamb yes. of God. Yes. Get a hold of Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Listen to carefully to this from 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness 
is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God yes. in the face of Christ. In other words, as Christians, we are to showcase yes, yes. Jesus. Yes. Yes. We are to be showmen. Showmen of the light of Jesus. Now listen to this. This is, this is going to, as I always say, it's going to get gooder. And some of you say about time. When Jesus was in the shadows, John the, Baptist, John the Baptist exalts him. When Jesus was in the shadows, John the Baptist exalts and magnifies Jesus. Then later, John the Baptist gets arrested. He's put in prison. He's at the end of his ministry. His six months are almost up. He's close to the end of his life. And what happens? Jesus now exalts John the Baptist. Yes. When Jesus was in the shadow, John the Baptist exalted Jesus. But now John finds himself in the shadows and Jesus exalts him. He says he's not just a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. That's where he says among those born of women, there's nobody greater than this man. Mm -hmm. So you know what I get out of that and I looked at that? It's not always in the spotlight that you get recognized by Jesus. Amen. Most of the time, it's in those dark shadows. Yes, amen. Most of the time, it's when you're going through what John went through. You're going through the lonely times. You're going through the hurt times. You're going through the desperate times. That's when you're going to get recognized. Ah, oh, isn't that good? Let me tell you something. If you haven't heard anything else, just grab a hold of that one. Because that's worth it all. It's when you're be behind the scenes that you get recognized. So anyways, Isaiah predicted the coming of John the Baptist in, in Isaiah chapter 40 where he says, calls him a voice crying out in the wilderness. And then Malachi also predicted that. So although it was 400 years of darkness, Malachi chapter 5, God was at work all the way through those pages that separate the Old Testament and the New Testament. God was at work. And John the Baptist was destined to become the greatest showman. So this John the Baptist is the very one that Malachi prophesied would come 400 years before. He said, Behold, I'm going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. I'm going to send to you Elijah the prophet before, before the coming of the Lord. It doesn't say John the Baptist. It says Elijah the prophet. But then Jesus says in Matthew 11 that John is Elijah who is to come, the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so if you look at that, scholars are very confused about that most of the time. Now John himself said that he wasn't Elijah, but Gabriel, the angel, remember the angel, says to Zechariah back there in Luke chapter 1, he said, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him, before Jesus, watch yes. this, in the spirit yes. of Elijah. Spirit. Yes. He, John the Baptist will go before Jesus in the spirit of so he wasn't a resurrected Elijah, but he no. came in the same yes. spirit, in the same anointing of yes. Elijah. Not as a, a Elijah in the literal sense, but no. the same spirit. What does that mean? It means his words and even his appearance was like that yes. of Elijah. They both wore camel hair. They had leather belts around their waist. Yes. They had a, a kindred spirit. Yes. They had the same anointing. The voice of John the Baptist and the voice of Elijah came at a spiritually dark time and it actually stung the ears of all the people who heard it. Yes. Yes. Ra Leonard Ravenhill said, Prophets are a strange breed of men. Yes. They're God's emergency men yes. for crisis hour. Both yes. of these men appear on the scene out of nowhere during dark times in history. Yes. As God's mouthpieces. Thank you. And they both had a message and a ministry of confrontation. Their message was not the watered down or permissive uh, hyper grace stuff that we hear today. They called sin, sin. They weren't afraid to confront the issue of sin regardless whether they were speaking to people or priests or politicians. Thank you, Jesus. 
to the people Elijah said, how long? He's talking to the people. How long are you going to hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow Him. Yeah. And if Baal is yeah. God, then follow Him. Right. In other words, he was saying to the people in his yeah. listening audience, quit playing games. It is yeah. time for you to make a decision. Yeah. Make up your mind. Choose one way or the other. Yeah. It was like the choice that Joshua put before the people when he said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We need preachers today who will present that choice to people. Who aren't afraid to present that choice to people. And we need people today who will make that choice. I said this morning... Caroline's mom died last week, and she had the funeral last week, I think it was uh, Monday, because they went to Rochester. And somebody told me that the, the preacher that did the funeral, they were pleased that gave an altar call. I give an altar call at every funeral I give. Yeah. And I've seen pastors who don't give altar calls, and I ask them why, and they said, eh, it's, you know, it's really not the time or place. So what do you mean? Yeah. That is the time and place. Yeah. I was talking to my pastor this past week, uh, Pastor Tilly. Uh, it was his birthday, so I called him. We were on the phone for a good 45 minutes. And I, says, I said, Pastor, you realize I've been preaching for 30, over 30 years now. He goes, my brother. Those of you who know him, <laughs> yeah. my brother. And uh, I said, you know, I do a lot of funerals. I says, and I found one thing. I would rather do funerals than weddings. I made a joke, I said, because when I buried them, they stay down. Right. <laughs> but that's not really it. I'm not really into pomp and circumstance of the wedding. But I get a chance to preach the gospel to people who haven't heard it. Yes. Yes. Usually hurting people when their hearts are tender. Yes. I'll tell you, that's when God moved on them. And to the people, John the Baptist, we talked about Elijah. You know, Elijah says, how long are you going to hesitate? John the Baptist, he also preached a hard message. What's he tell the people? The people that flock to him, what's he saying? He's not saying, oh, God is going to just bless you, honey. No, he's saying, repent and turn from your sins yes. and turn to God. And I believe that people will still flock to yes. hear a true gospel message. Yes. I mean, he holds out the Old Testament in his hand while holding out the New Testament in his heart. Yes. They didn't coddle these people. Amen. I think there's too many coddling in the church yes. today to grow the church. Right. To appease them in their sin. Yes. He didn't condemn them. <coughs> it was getting them to choose Jesus. Yes. That's the most loving thing that anybody yes. can ever do is get somebody to choose Jesus. Yes. He said, I'm holding out to you life and death today. You know, I got, I got to share this with you because this is incredible. Oh. Deuteronomy 30 says, I'm holding out to you today life or death. you got to make a choice. Now watch what it says else in there. And then he says, I'm holding out the option, life or death. you got a choice. And then he says, I'm calling on heaven and earth to witness your choice. Oh, King James says, I'm calling on heaven and earth to record your choice. What? So what's that mean? That means every time you are exposed to the gospel and given a chance to receive Jesus Christ, God makes a note of it. And when you refuse Him and you stand before Him, Say, God, I didn't know. Oh, yes, you did. I got a record of it. Oh. Yep. You sat in this service and a choice was given. You sat in this church and you spun it up. You oh. sat in this service. Depart from me. Jesus. You go. Oh. I have to get that from last year. Last week. I, last week's message was called Something Kidding. Something Kidding. Are you kidding yourself? Are you a goat? That same choice is going to be available to you today. And whatever you choose, those of you who aren't saved, and you walk out of this place without receiving, God records it. Uh -huh. yes. And one day He's going to say, that's it. Is that your final answer? Wrong. Yep. 
Because, you know, whenever a gospel message is given and a choice is given, somebody makes that final answer that day. Yeah. Whether it's yes or no, they make that final answer. That's right. Yeah. Okay, I get back to this so I can get you out. <laughs> to the priest, Elijah confronts the false re religion of his day and he proved to them in that showdown on Mount Carmel that his message was greater than theirs. Mm. That his message was more than words. It was demonstration of the spirit and power when he calls fire down from heaven and he proves the power of God. But I'll tell you something, that today there are a lot of churches, the Bible says, that have a form of religion but deny the power. What does that mean? That means they go through all the religious activities. They have a church. They have stained glass windows. They got steeples. But they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. Because most of them don't even believe it. They deny the power. Oh, that's not for today. And to the priest in John the Baptist days, he, he refers to them as a brood of vipers. Why? Because they took pride in being called the sons of Abraham. I'm a Christian. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Pente Pentecostal. And God let them know, or Elijah let them know, I'm sorry, John the Baptist let them know that God is able to raise up stones that could be called sons of Abraham. Yes. And then, as the people and the priests, and then to the politicians, Elijah and John the Baptist both paid high prices for their fearless denunciation of immoral behavior yes. by their respective kings. Uh -huh. yes. In other words, Jesus. they got into serious trouble for meddling into politics. Jesus. You shouldn't bring politics into the pulpit. See, they weren't worried about public opinion. They weren't worried about the IRS. They were only concerned about God's opinion. Yes. Yes, they weren't looking for the applause of men. They were looking for the approval of God. Yes. They both came confronting this anti-God government. Huh? Denouncing, listen to this, denouncing the evil trends yes. in society. Uh -huh. can, you, can you say that we have some evil trends in our society? Yes. And these evil trends, much of the church is not denouncing them, but they're embracing them. Yes. Uh -huh. They weren't afraid to denounce the evil trends of society without concern about being labeled this or that or intolerant or whatever it is. Yes, Lord Jesus. Help they weren't afraid to enter the political arena when politics clashed with the Word of God. Oh, they and if you've been around here long enough, you know that I'm not afraid to enter the political. And let me tell you, I get people who get mad at me and people who leave the church over it. Yeah. Politics, when it clashes with the Word of God, it is our duty. Yes. Yes. I don't care who the president is. When their policies clash with the Word of God, we have an obligation to speak out as Christians. You remember Elijah confronted King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, and he ends up with a target on his back. And in that same spirit, John the Baptist confronts King Herod about his relationship yeah. with Herodias, who was yeah. the wife of Herod's brother. Yeah. And what does Herod do? Has him thrown in jail. Now you've got to follow this. He has him thrown in prison. Wait a minute. I just got started in ministry here. I'm only six months into this thing. I've been, I've been working on this for 30 years. God's going to send an angel and get me out of here. Yeah. He must have thought that God abandoned him. Yeah, Just like Elijah yeah. did when he was fleeing from Jezebel after killing the 850 prophets, he finds himself in a cave of isolation and yes, depression. Yes. And both of them are in a place right now that we would like to be in awe for doing what God called them to do. Both of them were suffering for it. And we can't understand that. We question God when it happens to us. Yes, we do. And then on top of that, uh, at the request of Herodias' daughter, yeah. John the Baptist not only gets thrown in prison, he but he gets beheaded. beheaded. He Six months into his ministry, he's over. Yeah. Lost his head. Lost his head. He not only lost his 501c3 tax exempt status for bringing politics in the pulpit, he lost his head. He gets killed. 
for doing what God directed it. Lord, I thought I was going to have this glorious career ahead of me in ministry. I want to do crusades all over the world here. But even in prison, when he was facing death, he was still pointing people to Jesus. Why? Because he was the greatest showman. Would you bow your heads? That same Jesus and that same message of salvation is available today. And the same choice that Elijah gave to the people, how long will you hesitate, is given to you today. The same choice that John the Baptist, repent, is given to you today. If God is God, follow Him. Why won't you come and receive His gift of salvation? This is another opportunity, another choice that I want you to know. God is recording it. Okay, you gave them another chance. I got it recorded. If you don't know Christ, would you come? Amen. If you're going through something major. Would you just stand right where you are? <clears throat> Health, finances, relationship, something that you're struggling with. And it may seem like God is silent in what you're going through. Seems like He's not near. But I want you to know He's still at work in your life. When evening comes, the Bible says, there will be light. And maybe you're going through evening right now. There will be light. For some of you, even before this day is done, the light is going to come on. Suddenly, it's going to come on. Before the week is over, there's your answer. So Father, we commend every every one of these situations to you. They're going through Malachi chapter 5. But let the light of Jesus shine into their situation just like you did in Matthew chapter 1. You may be seated. And one last thing. As Christians, we are to be showmen. Showing the world Jesus by how we live, where we go, what we do, how we talk, how we walk, our lives. You know, you know. Somebody said I forgot who it was. Preach Jesus always, and if necessary, use words. And some of you need not use words. Just let your light shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Yes. Hiding under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. One more time. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Father, we're thankful, Lord, that Malachi chapter 5 didn't turn into Malachi chapter 6. We're thankful, Lord, that you broke through the darkness and you brought the light of Jesus into the world. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Lord, bring this to our hearts that we would be among the greatest showmen.